Um, so thank you all for um, listening to me, I guess, for the next uh, um, few minutes or so. I, I want to talk to you today about our research, some of our research on indigenous South African plants and specifically looking at um, nitrogen and phosphorus acquisition and, and studying it. So as Laura mentioned, my background actually for the last uh, many years has been in wood formation in eucalyptus. Um, and uh, just to briefly summarize it in one slide, my main approach was actually using systems genetics, which is where we actually use genetic perturbation of um, systems, in this case, a eucalyptus tree and wood formation, um, to reconstruct and almost reverse engineer complex biological processes uh, that are controlled by many genes. So systems genetics and, and conventional systems biology as well, where we, we use model organisms or, as well as different kinds of trees to perturb them. A part of this work has actually been our um, description and identification of a new plastid type um, involved in wood formation that we call the xyloplast, and that's hopefully going to be published soon. And then um, a lot of the approach was evolutionary biology, which was basically looking, taking an evo devo approach to uh, tree development and wood formation and looking at gene uh, networks involved in the regulation of development. So these three approaches, systems genetic, systems biology, and evolutionary biology are all really high level uh, ways of looking at systems and then you know where they intersect also getting different kinds of evidence to basically reverse engineer complex traits. And that's what I'm interested in. So wood formation as an example is controlled by hundreds if not thousands of genes. That's very different from let's say secondary metabolism where you have a few genes leading from a precursor to a, a final product. <clears throat> so these are the, the kind of hard problems in biology and especially biotechnology in plants, but very much worth addressing, of course, because many of them are um, economically and ecologically important. So skipping a whole lot of things, the, the, the main uh, switch I made in the last few years was partially inspired by this paper, which came out in 2015 already, um, highlighting the um, threat, the main threats, especially to biodiversity, as well as um, biogeochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus. And so I considered the fact that um, I'm, I'm living in a uh, highly biodiverse country, especially in plants. South Africa is probably fifth in the world for plant biodiversity. If we uh, take that, we have almost 10% of the world's plant species here with very high endemism. Um, and there's not a lot of research on molecular and systems biology of South African indigenous and endemic plants. And the second thing is Africa as a continent is going to need a lot of fertilizer over the next um, coming decades, especially to feed the increasing African population that's going to be growing there. And of course, the excessive use of um, fertilizer, not just for um, uh, not just the cost involved, but also the actual use of it often results in things like runoffs into oceans and water systems and pollution and a whole lot of things. And so I believe that advanced um, biotechnological solutions are going to be key for um, you know, the, the future of crop growing in the, on the continent and in the world. And so the, the general broad idea, the highest level is saying, if we have a problem with needing additional um, nutrients being added to plants, and part of the strategy is gonna be adaptation. A lot of that is gonna be using conventional methods like either selection for land races and accelerator breeding using genetics, as well as using things like indigenous African um, crops and, and developing them. There will also be biotechnological solutions that rely on understanding plants that are growing on the African continent, modeling biology that has to do with um, acquisition of nitrogen or phosphorus where uh, normally crops can't get it, and then using a synthetic biology approach, ultimately engineering some of these complex traits um, as needed for specific crops. And so I, I do see uh, this as a, a strategy. If you are part of the uh, plant synthetic biology community in general, you might have heard of the phytobrick um, system, and that's um, common domestication basically of biological parts of plants that allow then global exchange of parts and that really to advance the research of, um, of synthetic biology in plants. And so I'm a big proponent of that whole um, phytobrick system. So please do look it up if you're producing biological parts um, that you would like to see used in other circuits and other advanced engineering. Um, please do have a look at the phytobrick model if you're not familiar with it. Um, and so I'll just jump right into it and start with, um, I'll be talking about nitrogen and then phosphorus today and our research in it. And, to talk about nitrogen, we were looking at a South African indigenous species um, of cycad, which has a fairly unique strategy of acquiring nitrogen. So <clears throat> this is a paper we'll be submitting soon. Um, it's been the master's work of Cassandra Skuman, who's a PhD student with me now in my lab, and she's um, she's actually on this call as well. Um, and Danielle Ruit, who was a postdoc with me, 
um, for a number of years. She's now in the Netherlands. Um, and, and so what we wanted to understand is this cycad cyanobacterial um, partnership for nitrogen acquisition. Um, this was also a collaboration with Talani Makalignani and, and um, his postdoc, Oliver Bezet, also at the University of Pretoria. Um, and Desiree Pinard was another postdoc um, in my group. She's now working for um, Bayer. So um, just to quickly talk about nutrient acquisition, phosphorus and nitrogen, and most plants, most land plants, and it's ancestral to land plants, um, as we know, have mycorrhizal symbioses. These really represent most of the uh, plant microbe symbioses in terms of how plants acquire um, nitrogen and phosphorus, especially phosphorus, but basically bioavailable versions of these molecules. Um, there are a number of kind of evolved strategies for associations with fungi. So our vascular mycorrhiza is one um, and, and the majority of plants. You also get ectomycorrhiza, which you find in some pines, some gymnosperms, as well as in some um, the casserines, I believe, or some of the phagales, um, order phagales. And then you also have um, ericoid mycorrhiza, which occur in the ericales, um, as well as orchid mycorrhiza, which even though represent 10% of, of the species, of course, as we know, orchids are really species. And so really this is a, a specialized kind of, um, in, in the context of all of land plants, um, a unique uh, kind of adaptation. But these are the four main described um, fungal associations. And then for nitrogen acquisition, you have um, some plants that have adapted to nitrogen fixing symbioses. And so we know there is this nitrogen fixing clade. These are four major orders. The, um, um, so it's the Phagales, Fabales, Rosids, and the uh, Curcubitales, I believe. But uh, in general, what we, we mainly know legumes as the um, Fabales having these nodules, specialized nodules that host um, rhizobia. And then you also have some species that host Frankia. Um, bacteria and form symbioses with these, and these can be nodulating or not. And so um, these are also fairly specialized, although it should be said that these are very large uh, orders which contain many, many species. So that's another strategy plants have for nitrogen acquisition. And, um, and it's also notable that most of these plants, in addition to these nodules uh, with bacterial associations, also have uh, fungal associations. Um, so associations with mycorrhiza and things like that. So maybe a general high level view of this, um, and this is also part of the work that um, Cassandra Schumann is working on, is actually saying there are common symbiosis pathway genes. Um, these are genes present in plant genomes, and we know for a fact that there is some overlap between these common symbiosis pathway genes, the presence and the activity of these genes in plants, and the communication with both um, fungi and um, bacteria, with ectomycorrhiza being an exception here. But um, th there is definitely some co-option and sub-functionalization of what was presumably initially a um, fungal um, symbiosis to then communicate with and facilitate interactions with things like bacteria. So I say this in the context of the work of cycads. A really interesting case in the, in the context of land plant evolution are four independently evolved events of plant cyanobacterial symbiosis for nitrogen acquisition. So this is, you can actually find it in the hornworts or liverworts, so very basal uh, land plants. You can find it in one species of fern, the, uh, or one, sorry, a genus of fern, but the water fern azola um, have this as a, a kind of internal uh, symbiont in the leaf cavity. These are kind of um, microscopic ferns, if you're not familiar with azola, that kind of live on the surface of the water. Um, and then cycads, all cycads across the world um, produce these specialized roots called coralloid roots, which are actually, they grow um, upwards towards the sun. And if you take a cross section, you can go to any cycad, just wear gloves because they're toxic. Uh, if you're really interested, cut a little bit of a coralloid root and you can actually see this with the naked eye, this ring of cyanobacteria that's being hosted in these specialized roots. That is a partnership where the plant is providing carbon to the cyanobacterium and the cyanobacteria in return is giving nitrogen to the plant. And then there is one um, angiosperm uh, lineage, which is Gunnarali's, um, a, a fairly, um, um, a core eudicot, but a, a fairly ancestral one, which has specialized stem glands where it's hosting cyanobacteria inside the stem. So we have four independent um, uh, associations of plants and cyanobacteria. Um, it's interesting that you can actually, this is an aside, that you can take um, cyanobacteria from one of these and inoculate into another and it will functionally form this association, which is really unexpected given the, these are um, highly independent and the separation between these have been, um, you know, in the case of cycads 350 million years ago, in the case of um, these bryophytes even longer. 
Um, it's interesting that you can cross inoculate these, uh, but but yes, you have these uh, plant cyanobacterial symbiosis. So we were really interested there. They have sequenced the genome of a hornwort and an azola looking specifically at the plant cyanobacterial uh, relationships. Gunnera has not been sequenced yet, although there are a number of genomes that will be published soon, um, probably. And although the Psychiat genome has been published now as of, I think it was last year or the year before, um, this relationship with cyanobacteria is not really understood in terms of what genes is the plant expressing, how is the nutrient exchange happening, et cetera. Um, it's also notable that some of these are extracellular associations. Um, so the cycad in this case, in the coralloid roots, actually creates a cavity um, between some cells which hosts uh, the cyanobacteria, whereas in the case of gunnera, these are actually inside cells, um, inside the plant cell. So a whole kind of uh, interesting biology to explore there. And so um, we were interested in, in the development of uh, coralloid roots, but more so in how the, the cycads um, basically host the cyanobacteria once they're inside there already. So just to give you a context, cycads produce these pre-coralloid roots, and they're still not sure what the ontogenic kind of origin of these are. The uh, canonical literature from the 70s says these are uh, modified lateral roots. Um, and then there is secretion of pre-coralloid roots, which develop. There is secretion of factors that then um, recruit and actually cause um, cyanobacteria in the soil to become motile, uh, crawl into the root, and then become um, kind of uh, inhabit the root. And the coralloid root then matures. And ultimately, there are lots of vegetative cells. These are photosynthetic cyanobacterial cells. And after a while, with mature coralloid roots especially, what you have is the emergence of a lot of heterocyst forms of the cyanobacterial cells. So these are basically the form of the, the form of the cell that uh, enables the cyanobacterium to take atmospheric um, nitrogen and then um, convert it into a bioavailable uh, form for the plant to then uh, have an, as an uptake. So if you're not familiar with um, cyanobacteria at all, even um, free living cyanobacteria um, have these mostly live in these vegetative cells which are photosynthetic. But in, in um, environments of low nitrogen, they actually form these filamentous forms where signaling causes every few cells, usually every three cells or every even longer, um, to become a heterocyst. This is this nitrogen fixing cell form. Whereas in symbiosis with plants, what we find is basically higher frequency of heterocysts. So we can use this also as an indicator to ask, depending on the frequency of heterocysts we see in the plant, um, whether active nitrogen fixation is happening um, probably in service of the plant. So, and, and just to say, these are also from literature, just um, the, the electron microscopy versions of these. The heterocysts can be identified um, by like almost a cell wall and this um, uh, nitrogen rich plug that forms. This has to be a very anoxic environment for um, nitrogen fixation. So you have to switch off the photosynthetic machinery and, and um, activate nitrogenase and the associated um, pathways. So we wanted to answer three main questions in terms of what were open questions in the literature. The one is, first of all, we wanted to establish that what we're gonna do all of these omics on in systems biology and try to figure out um, what genes are being used is, are we actually sampling the right thing? Is it the right model system? And so we wanted to ask whether nitrogen, active nitrogen is being supplied by the bacteria to the cycad. And just going through this quickly, um, Cassandra did some wonderful microscopy of <clears throat> the cyanobacterial zone. You can see that here as basically this zone here. You have these um, cells, columnar cells that connect um, between the roots, but this is an extracellular association with the mucilage rich matrix that basically hosts these bacterial cells. Um, and then um, uh, and these, are, these are actually bacterial cells in, these, uh, in this zone. Um, and so we did actually identify there are bacterial cells in the zone. We also then studied pre-coralloid roots and saw that the cycad actually prepares the cyanobacterial zone even before colonization of cyanobacteria from the soil. And so this is a, a relatively new finding showing that the mucilaginous matrix and the zone is being defined. So this is a developmental and a metabolic thing because these are carbon rich polysaccharides, et cetera, that the plant has to produce almost to host um, the cyanobacteria. Um, but briefly that we established that we did have cyanobacteria that are colonizing the roots. The other thing we noticed is that the development of some of these um, cells, especially in the pre-coralloid roots and the coralloid root cells, did not seem to be derived from lateral roots, as has been suggested in the literature. We think it's closer related to a, a primary root or something like that. So that still has to be resolved in the literature. But focusing on the nitrogen metabolism, um, what Cassandra did was um, painstakingly actually then do electron microscopy of many, many sections of coralloid roots and count and, and look at the proportion of heterocysts that she could identify in coralloid roots 
um, in the cycad um, uh, as opposed to the vegetative um, cells of the cyanobacteria. And she found a really high proportion, 60% uh, or more, which is indicative that indeed there is active nitrogen uh, metabolism happening in the cyanobacteria and supply to the cycad. We did the same work in um, Azola and in, um, in Gunnera because we wanted to see whether this is consistent between the species, even though these are independently evolved events. And then also, since there was no genetic information for Gunnera, we, we did some transcriptomics to, and assembled the gene catalog and did some preferential gene expression to also have some comparison of genes because we, we had um, gene expression and uh, data from the uh, bryophyte and the Azola. And so the microscopy is basically to say we did find evidence for this. And the second question is there's an open question, especially in cycads, on how is the cyanobacteria actually providing um, nitrogen to the cycad. So to do this, what we did was we sequenced, we sampled 10 tissues and organs, coralloid roots, um, germinating seeds, immature leaf, immature rochus, um, leaf base, this is lower primary root, mature leaf, um, stem, upper primary root, and mature rochus. So we, we sampled 10 um, different tissues and organs, and we assembled a gene catalog, basically, from de novo transcriptome assembly. This is using Illumina sequencing. And you can see here that there's quite nice separation between the root types. Moreover, that the coralloid root really form their own kind of unique biology. In fact, in the clustering, um, oh, I had to remember all of these off by heart. It turns out I had them all on the slide. But you can see, see the different tissues and organs we sampled. Um, uh, and basically, the, the main result was seeing the really different expression, gene expression, and unique genes being expressed in coralloid roots, these specialized roots, compared to other roots uh, in the cycad, which is what we were interested in. And they were, in fact, more different from other roots than they were from any other tissues. So these were quite specialized. These sets of genes that are upregulated in coralloid roots specifically are plant genes from the cycad that are uniquely um, probably involved in cyanobacterial uh, symbiosis and nitrogen acquisition, as well as providing carbon, uh, presumably, to the cyanobacterium. And so doing this using a whole lot of omics, uh, I won't go into all of the details, but we identified and narrowed down a number of genes. One of the main questions we had was previously, what they did was uh, using chemical analysis, they sampled the xylem sap of coralloid roots and identified high quantities of glutamine and glutamate and some citrulline. As, the, as what they supposed was the primary um, source of nitrogen that's being given from the cyanobacterium to the plant. Now, what's not certain is whether that's being produced actively by the cyanobacterium in coralloid roots, or whether it's produced by nitrogen from the cyanobacterium as ammonia or something else um, by cycad genes. And so that's part of the question we wanted to answer. And skipping a whole lot of things, <clears throat> we could the main thing we could do is rule out um, sorry, not skipping experimentally. This is me skipping for the sake of being brief in the presentation. We could rule out that um, um, there was any kind of import of nitrogen because all of the major transporters that would be involved in nitrate transporters are basically not expressed in coralloid roots, um, uh, as well as these other uh, forms of, of kind of bioavailable uh, nitrogen that would be in the environment. So, so we could rule out that there was any um, um, any other acquisition of nitrogen, what we could see in coralloid roots was really high expression of these two genes, GDHA and GLMA, or at least um, genes we could annotate like that in the cycad because we had to de novo assemble everything. There was no genome available. Um, and so what these would mean is that um, NH3 is being converted into glutamate and glutamine. And the other thing you'll notice here in blue is that the primary genes being upregulated in coralloid roots basically represented this pathway all the way into ornithine and citrulline synthesis. And so these results are consistent with the fact that the cycad is most likely getting um, NH3 um, from the cyanobacterium and then, and then using its own genes and its own uh, metabolism, producing these, um, these amino acids. And then the other interesting thing was, was that, that we saw these um, versions, uh, converted versions of these and genes involved in those are highly expressed in other root types, which means these are then provided in the, produced in the coralloid roots, um, uh, transported through the xylem, and then um, uh, provided to other parts of the plant where that's used as the nitrogen source. So that was one of the main um, findings we had is assimilation of ammonia into ornithine and citrulline um, is highly coralloid root specific. And these were kind of sub-functionalization of um, metabolic pathways in the cycad. Um, I'm going to skip this for the sake of Brevity, but also just to say that uh, based on our results, we don't think that it's the cyanobacterium that's producing the amino acids, as has been thought in some literature. 
Um, we think this is mainly the cycad is partially, if not entirely, responsible for the production of these uh, nitrogen source from, from ammonia that the bacterium produces. And then just finally, you know, we could do some evo devo analysis because now we have the genes and we could draw some analysis between different species. So um, we had candidate genes that we could isolate. We'd identified from literature candidate genes that might be involved in common symbiosis pathway or um, any other uh, relationship. This was uh, put together comprehensively by Cassandra and several hundred genes. And then we could query those and their orthologs, paralogs, whatever um, um, relatives in these other plants that host cyanobacteria. So in this case, um, Anthoceros is the hornwort, um, the Azola genome, and this is publicly available data. And then we produce data for uh, Gunnera and transcriptome data as well to look for some of these genes. And the question of course is to say, did these plants, how did these plants independently um, evolve these um, strategies? And we could compare those as well to some other bacterial hosting species, including Rhizobia and Frankia um, hosting species. So we found analogous data where we could and compared this in an evolutionary um, comparative transcriptomics, if you will, to uh, try to figure out this biology. And long story short, after a lot of comparisons of tissue specific analyses and um, evolutionary analyses, what we basically find is that all of the um, major carbon um, um, common symbiosis pathway genes in CICAD, <coughs> including those involved in our buscal mycorrhiza associations, were highly expressed in the coralloid roots actually of Encephalarctus natalensis. And so this was somewhat surprising to us that the arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis genes were expressed. This might mean that some common symbiosis pathway genes have been co-opted by the cycad for interacting with the cyanobacteria. But of course, there was always the risk that we had um, the cycads also form association with fungi, that the coralloid roots themselves contained some fungus. And so this was the reason for the expression of some of these genes. So to rule that out, what we actually did was um, metagenomic analysis. I'll just skip through this. We did some metagenomic analysis and, and sequenced total DNA and assemb de novo assembled any genomes. So this wasn't an, um, a 16S RNA preamplification or anything. This was total metagenomics and assembling of really any genomes, prokaryotic, eukaryotic, viral, et cetera, from coralloid root to ask the question of whether we have fungi or anything else indeed contributing um, to the expression of these uh, genes. And actually what we found was overwhelmingly that we basically found even one strain of Nostox, so not even a diversity of different cyanobacteria um, are present in these coralloid root samples. We sequenced to quite high depth and we could check in terms of um, how deep it was. And basically we found zero bacteria, fungi or other viruses in the root, which is quite shocking. It means, well, shocking. It was quite um, surprising because it means that the cycad, the plant itself is really curating the environment for the cyanobacteria to uh, exist alone. Presumably there's a role of the cyanobacteria in that as well. And that's still to be explored, which excludes all of these other species. It also then lends credence to our claim that actually the result is then that cycads have neo-functionalized some of the genes and pathways involved in um, uh, or buscular mycorrhizal for cyanobacterial um, interactions. And that's still, uh, we don't know how. But just basically the, the main point that this answered, and um, I hope this drives some of the research forwards in cycads and other cyanobacterial interactions in plants, is to provide evidence for this um, uh, ongoing and active nitrogen fixing symbiosis. We answer this question of how is the nitrogen receiving and making its own nitrogen in these coralloid roots and also showing some neo-functionalization. All of this also has to do with understanding the evolution of plant bacterial um, symbiosis, but also how we might think of engineering some of these traits into plants one day, um, if we can isolate these circuits into different developmental and then metabolic and um, interacting. So obviously lots more questions to answer, but I think this also has biotechnological potential in terms of um, engineering nitrogen acquisition properties into plants uh, as well in the future. Um, I hope everyone's still with me and can hear me. I'm just talking, so I can't see or hear anyone. Um, uh, from that, I'd like to move on from nitrogen to phosphorus. Um, and again, the opportunity we have in South Africa, this is part of uh, talking about Fainbos as well. Uh, I don't know if some may know this and some may not, but South Africa is, uh, Southern Africa is about 10% of the world's plant species. So um, depending on the numbers you can find, um, we are we only occupy about 0.5 percent of the of the Earth's surface, so it's South Africa. So we have quite a disproportionate overabundance of biodiversity of plants, um, mostly in the Fynbos region, actually, which is crazy. We actually have a quarter of the whole continent's biodiversity on two percent of Africa's land, and so the Fynbos becomes a really important 
um, South African and African resource for biodiversity in terms of um, taking care of it, studying it, understanding it, and then also benefiting from it. Um, you should also be aware, though, that West Africa, especially in areas of Tanzania and um, Uganda, and of course, DRC, have really high um, species richness. The one unique thing about the Fainbos is its high endemicity, as we might know. Madagascar as well should be included here. But the Fainbos contains not only about 9,000 species, it's got about 60-70% endemicity. And so some of you may have heard this stats that Table Mountain has as many species as the UK. Now, of course, for me, coming from a, a background of wood biotechnology, um, not a background of ecology or taxonomy, or I, I've really had to teach myself all about plant um, lineages within angiosperms, especially and especially Fainbos um, species. Thankfully, there are many resources done by years of decades of um, South African biodiversity researchers to enable molecular systems biologists like me to enter into indigenous plant. So I'm very grateful for that. <clears throat> the one thing to say about the Cape Floristic region is that it is um, mega diverse. And this is the famous biome and makes up a large proportion of this in terms of the species numbers. Um, and the, the interesting thing about this is actually other than the, the high endemicity of plants that occur there and, and only there is the presence of species that have found different strategies for acquiring phosphorus. And that's not always through association with microorganisms. Um, and in the case of, you know, we can look at protea or restios, uh, like, such as elegia um, or tetraria or sedge, um, sedges that grow in the Fainbos region. Um, these plants have kind of unique innovations for phosphorus acquisition. So these plants, and this has been described um, best in the Southwestern Australian floristic region and its flora, um, by um, Hans Lambers and a lot of the research going on in Australia in terms of the literature on this. But phosphorus mining routes are specialized adaptation of many of these lineages um, that are an alternative strategy to acquire phosphorus. So, so usually plants, when they're looking for phosphorus, who do not have these specialized routes and might not have any mycorrhizal associations at the moment, um, basically start exploring the environment and growing longer lateral roots, extending the roots, and actually um, almost searching for phosphorus. So growing in the direction uh, usually where they can sense it. The difference with these species is that they can produce these specialized phosphorus mining roots. Um, these are most described as proteoid roots um, because they were first described in the proteaceae, or cluster roots because they look like clusters. But essentially what these roots do is there's the specialized metabolic function is to produce um, a lot of organic acids that get extruded into the soil, which essentially um, help break up the soil. And, um, and then these organic acids actually then replace phosphorus, which is locked up in magnesium phosphate or, or iron phosphate or calcium phosphate. So a lot of these metal phosphates where the phosphorus is not bioavailable, the organic acid, along with phosphatases being released by the plant, produce these, um, uh, create an environment and add the acidic conditions of the soils of the Fainbos and where these plants usually adapt, create the conditions for um, phosphorus to basically become bioavailable for the plant. So these plants have a different strategy from just um, looking for bioavailable phosphorus through associations. They actually can mine phosphorus out of the soil where it's, again, in high abundance, but not bioavailable. So cluster roots is one strategy. And the literature is also described um, in, uh, in the monocots, um, capillaroid roots, which have only really been described, not really uh, studied to any amount um, in restios. And as we know, South Africa has uh, the center of diversity for restios, um, as well as some sedges, which produce these so-called dorsiform roots. These are almost look like carrots, but they little fat roots. Um, but the point is these are all, uh, and sorry, and legumes such as this is best studied in white lupin, but also present in rooibos and a number of other fainbos legumes. Um, these four strategies of two cluster roots in the eudicots and two other phosphorus mining roots in the monocots are presumably independently evolved given uh, the location of where we actually observe them in the um, in plant evolution. <clears throat> And so to be able to study these specialized types of roots, these capillaroid roots or dorsiform roots or um, uh, both kinds of cluster roots, both in the basal um, proteaceae and proteales, as well as the, um, the um, uh, legumes that produce cluster roots, we need to have really good genomes. We need to be able to apply these systems biology methods. And so to do that, um, one of the strategies, this motivated the sequencing of genome of the uh, king protea, protea sinoroides, Although I have to admit, I did this partly as a patriotic act, being a South African and wanting to sequence our national flower. Um, this will be published soon. We're just doing the revisions, but it'll probably come out in the next few weeks. But I think, and I stand to be corrected here, this is the first endemic South African plant genome species to be sequenced. 
Um, which is, on the one hand, I'm really happy about it, but on the other hand, given the fact that we have so many species, we're really behind um, other countries that are thinking about this critically, especially its role in, in um, translating to, um, to biotechnology, which I'll talk about at the end. But for now, let's talk a little bit about Protea because I'm really um, excited about this whole work. This was a collaboration with um, uh, University of Ghent and BIB. This is Prof. Uh, Evan Appears lab. And um, the two first authors are uh, Jiang Chang, who's a PhD student with, um, with Eve, um, as well as Tuan Dong, who's um, a professor at FABI as well, uh, and a collaborator of mine, um, who really um, have been involved in the assembly annotation and some of the evolutionary analysis. And then, as you can see, we also partnered with um, Nigel Barker, who's, who's uh, in the uh, Department of Plant and Soil Sciences at UP. Um, Nigel's been working on Proteaceae for a long time in South Africa. Um, as well as um, uh, Danielle Root and Cassandra Skuman again, and, and, and Shyama uh, and Chen Li are also um, part of Eve Bonapir's group. So um, between our two labs, we did some analyses of constructing the first uh, kind of chromosome level assembly, a very high confidence level assembly. So uh, I should pause here because I'm not going to talk too much technically, but to say that um, today we can sequence, if a plant genome is between 500 megs to a gig, uh, a gigabase, we can actually sequence it fairly easily and cost-effectively using a combination of long read methods, short read methods, and some kind of um, chromosomal mapping. So we used um, chromatin mapping. So we used HiC, we used the dovetail genomics um, kit, and then Illumina sequencing to do that. But essentially, this involves sequencing long reads, um, correcting them with short reads, um, as doing a de novo assembly, and then scaffolding that with some kind of um, um, high C or another method of pulling that together into chromosome structures. So doing that without any genetic mapping or anything like that, we were able to assemble all 12 chromosomes of Protea uh, with really high confidence. This is the entire genome um, showing you the chromosome structures. The chromosomes are not numbered here 1 to 12. They're actually arranged in terms of the uh, intra-genome uh, identity in terms of synteny um, due to a whole genome duplication in the in the um, species, in the, in the family, actually. Um, but this, the, so this outermost layer, so this shows you, for example, this is chromosome one over here. I'm not sure if my mouse is visible. Let me actually do a laser pointer. Um, if this is a chromosome, this is the gene density. So lots of genes here, not a lot of genes here. Um, but one weird thing about this was when we assembled it, the genome size was 1.2 gigabases, which is, um, there's been some debate over the size of different protea species genome sizes. But we could actually see that we assembled 96% of the genome sequencing data in uh, 12 chromosomes uh, of 1.2 gigabases. This is about 500 gigs, so probably 500 million bases bigger than the nearest sequenced family member um, in the Proteaceae, which is macadamia, that was published last year. And so we, we wondered whether Protea had some kind of repeated genome duplication or where all this extra DNA came from in the genome. It doesn't have an excessively high gene number, so around 33, which is average for a plant. Um, although we did manage and we feel quite confident that we have a high quality assembly with, with um, well annotated gene models. Um, <coughs> and, and the nice thing about being able to assemble chromosome level assemblies is that you can quantify and actually study the non-coding regions of the DNA. And so being able to have this high quality assembly allowed us to really annotate the um, non-coding uh, transposable elements. And what we found was that Sinoroides, specifically the King Protea um, as a species, had this explosion of gypsy um, LTR retrotransposable elements. And we can date this to about two and a half million years ago. So this means it's not something that's genus specific, it's actually something to the species, um, which we can't really explain. But uh, it's displayed here in terms of, so almost 50% of the genome size is actually because of these um, um, gypsy um, LTR retrotransposons that have, you can see here the density in this track of how much they make up of the genome and where. So that was a very interesting finding for us and, and one of the advantages of having uh, a chromosome level assembly. Uh, the other advantage is to be able to use more advanced strategies for um, determining whole genome duplication, synteny, and a whole lot of things. These are things you can't do if you just have a, um, a de novo assembly of the gene catalog or even a genome assembly from just short reads. One of my research areas in collaboration with uh, Eve, who's the world expert on this, is looking at the evolutionary significance of polyploidy, so um, whole genome duplications, and specifically ancient whole genome duplication. This is a review we published in 2017, but it, it shows still quite nicely how, um, especially in angiosperms, um, but in many other species, including those that are not plants, you actually observe um, historical whole genome duplications that have been 
Um, in the case of the, the one happening in the KPG boundary around 65 million years ago, these have been observed independently in many, many different plant lineages. So what that means is all of the plants surviving today in these lineages, and these are most flowering plants, have a history of an ancient whole genome duplication. Some of them are very recent, especially in the case of monocots, grasses have experienced recent whole genome duplications. But in the case of other lineages, you usually find a common around 65 million years ago, or the KPG, the Cretaceous Paleogene Extinction Event, um, which basically is when the dinosaurs stopped and groups like the grasses started and a whole lot of things happened, um, which suggests that whole genome duplication was actually really important for the survival of these lineages. And there are a number of theories, which I'm going to go into now. We've done a lot of research on looking at uh, different of these and testing some of these. And in fact, Eve's um, main research now is also simulating some of that for uh, and, and testing some of that empirically. Um, the, the main point here is to say it's really important for us to understand in plants if there has been an ancient whole genome duplication and to what extent that may have contributed to um, innovation in the lineage. Uh, and maybe just to go back to the um, example of uh, nodulating plants, some of that innovation is thought to be due to a whole genome duplication specific to um, uh, that lineage as well. So, so um, often we find that we can link biological functions and complex traits to uh, gene duplication, often as a result of whole genome duplication. So using a number of methods, and there are, there are three main approaches to determining whether there has been an ancient whole genome duplication. A lot of pa uh, people and papers and groups are just determining it using a uh, substitution model, so KS plots and determining that. That has some error rates, and so we use the combination of just KS distribution analysis. This is where you look at substitution uh, within a species of the paralogs and looking at evolutionary rates and whether there have been cases of duplication. You can also do this using absolute dating, which is where you actually create a, a, a phylogeny of different species and do a similar KS approach, but actually then have a lot more um, robust um, data because you're having it from multiple species trees. So that's a much more accurate way of determining the absolute dating. Um, there are also syntenic met methods, which are coming, uh, syntony-based um, methods to determine whole genome duplication, which um, even the Peers group has been developing over the last few years, which are really proving even more robust now that we have um, whole genomes that we can compare. In any case, uh, using both of these methods, we we determined that, um, so what we knew was that protea was, uh, macadamia, sorry, which is the nearest sequence relative of protea, was reported to have a whole genome duplication around 40 million years ago. Now we identified a whole genome duplication in protea, but we dated it slightly older. And using some of these combinatorial approaches, we actually established that this ancient whole genome duplication in the Proteaceae, which um, we date to around 59 to 77 million years ago, um, would have been present in a common ancestor of Protea, Macadamia, and um, this is Warata, which was also released recently, so we could add it to our analysis. Um, but the point is, within the Proteaceae, we think there was one ancestral genome duplication that occurred independent from the other members of the Proteales, uh, Nalumbo, the sacred lotus, which also experienced an independent whole genome duplication 65 million years ago. Um, so that was um, the other kind of finding. And just to say with that, that after this duplication, the protea genome evolved quite slowly. And so there's been very little, relatively very little genome rearrangement since the whole genome duplication 65 million years ago. That's really beneficial for us because it allows us to start to start studying microcentony and macrocentony even when we're looking at genomic rearrangements in other plants. Remember the protea, protea and the proteaceae in general are basal eudicots. So most eudicot species are actually in this clade that experienced the hexaploidy event. Here we're showing Vetus um, grape and showing how there's a two to three relationship between protea and macadamia versus um, Vetus. Um, because they didn't experience this ancient hexaploidization event, these basal eudicots represent really good um, models or, or groups to study how genomes actually evolved them. And, um, I have a nicer version of this, but this is the background data to show you what I'm about to show you in the next slide. Um, some of the other basal um, eudicots are the ranunculales, the, the buttercups and um, things like poppies. So the um, opium poppy and other poppies related have been sequenced recently. And what we could do with the protea genome, because of its very conserved genome structure and low rearrangement, is then look at synteny methods to determine how many whole genome duplication events actually occurred in these lineages. So we tested some well-established ones such as these and other ranunculales um, species that have been sequenced. But in poppies, there was a uh, we actually found an additional whole genome duplication in one of the species sequenced. So 
what this is essentially showing is that we could either find a two to two relationship, which means um, both experienced a single whole genome duplication, or a two to four, where every two syntenic regions had four syntenic regions in somniferin, for example. This showed there an additional whole genome duplication event in the history of this species, and then an additional one on top of that um, in Setigura. And so the main takeaway from this is to say that low genomic rearrangement in Protea um, allowed us to actually improve our whole genome identification, because these weren't called in the original poppy papers that were published uh, in this way, and so we could correct that as well. So it shows you the utility of sequencing a high quality um, genome, just, just the genome, without uh, any other uh, data on it, if you have this kind of data. So I just want to go back as I finish to talk about some of the biology we're pursuing now, having a reference genome for this, is looking at phosphorus acquisition. So remember I said uh, the common symbiosis pathway genes are present in um, most plant species. The, the whole family Proteaceae are actually unable to form associations with any fungi. Um, most of them, but not all of them, are adapted to grow in the Cape Floristic region or the Southwestern Australian Floristic region, where in general, um, plants have cluster uh, phosphorus mining roots. But in general, Proteaceae who, that, that um, grow all around the world are unable to form these associations. So we had a hypothesis about gene loss. This has been observed repeatedly in multiple plant lineages. And indeed, when we looked at the, again, the common symbiosis pathway genes and some of the arbuscular mycorrhizal conserved genes, we could see that these genomes um, in the Proteaceae and even the Proteales have experienced losses. Now, whether this loss is um, of these key arbuscular mycorrhizal communication genes, as well as the common symbiosis genes, whether this was ancestral and lost in all of them or secondarily lost, which has also been observed in other lineages, um, we don't know. And the second thing we don't know is whether this evolved prior to or in, um, in the same time as or after the, evo the, the evolution of cluster roots, because that would be an alternative way of acquiring phosphorus in these um, phosphorus um, low nutrient soils. So these are still open questions after this, but the point is we can now explain why the entire Proteaceae um, are unable to form these associations. So just to finish off, this will be Cassandra's PhD um, um, that she's pursuing, and we already have these species growing in hydroponics and if you limit, this is in collaboration with Mark Maestri, uh, Dr. Mark Maestri at, the, at um, Durban University of Technology. Um, and here we're in hydroponics, um, basically getting these plants to produce these specialized phosphorus mining roots by limiting phosphorus. And using similar approaches, we're going to model the development and, and metabolism involved in phosphorus mining roots. And again, since these evolved independently multiple times, this might give us uh, an indication of how to put this data together for engineering of some of these traits into um, species of interest. So I want to finish off by highlighting just a few issues in general about this transition between fundamental research, biotechnology, and who's funding what in the world, if, if you'll allow me five minutes. Is that okay, Laura? Go for it. This is a paper published by uh, Rose Marks recently. She's an early career researcher from the U.S. And uh, Rose and her collaborators have really put together um, two incredible papers that I recommend you actually invite Rose to give a talk uh, separately on this and her work another time. But basically, this was this came out um, uh, last year or the year before, talking about representation and participation across 20 years of plant genome sequencing. They painstakingly tracked um, a whole lot of data and who published it and what was it about. And as you can see, most of the species um, selected are from the global north, and most of the labs actually responsible for the production of the data are sitting in the global north. So the main takeaway from this is of the 800 fully sequenced plant genomes we're sitting with today, none were led by African researchers, um, and almost none represent endemic African species. Even those that do, the primary researcher was probably sitting overseas in the lab. So we, there's this discussion of helicopter science and, and how are we doing research in the global south. Um, there is also, I think, a lot of onus on us in the global south to have the conversation about how much are we pushing our own governments um, to fund research that's not necessarily applicable tomorrow, which is where we're going more and more. And that's another discussion. Um, a more recent paper, which is now available on BioArchive, that uh, I understand will be published soon in a journal, but um, again, Rose uh, had a look at, and her colleagues had a look at um, disparities in plant science and uh, really highlighting the legacy of colonialism, patriarchy, and exclusion. And just showing this of talking about where plant biodiversity is, if we're talking about studying indigenous plant species, um, most of the biodiversity of plants is actually sitting in the global south um, in terms of what species are there and where the diversity is. But if we look at where um, plant scientists actually sit, most of that is actually in the global north. And as we know, the US, Europe, and the UK, and um, uh, 
and especially uh, China over the last few years, are really maturing bioeconomies in terms of advanced uh, methods, going all the way from uh, fundamental curiosity-driven research to actually production and forming of companies that are making money um, off of this. And so part of the disparity we need to look at in the global south over the next coming decades, I think, is the fact that the species and the biodiversity that's going to be used for novel molecules, medicines, et cetera, everything we're interested in, um, we don't possess traditionally the economies to actually deal with it, and neither are our innovation systems mature enough to actually benefit from it in the time it takes before other countries in the global north mostly would be able to benefit from just raw genome sequences and who's producing it. And so, and, and, and sorry, just to highlight another uh, element of this is the fact of how much was um, female-led research. And you can see the statistics. I thought this would be interesting since we are uh, in the ICGB, um, that India had one of the lowest um, uh, plant science leadership by female researchers at 21%. Italy counted as high, but that was 41%. And I understand from Rose, South Africa was around 31%. My overall message here is we could and should be doing a lot better in correcting this and encouraging um, female scientists to become professors and research leaders because this is actually a huge disparity that, that is a problem here. Um, so a, a whole other discussion, but just the main message here is to say, um, where is the biodiversity sitting and where are the economies that can derive value from it? And I say this because in theory, South Africa is ideally positioned to derive value from its biodiversity. We've spent decades um, describing our biodiversity, where it is, what it is, what the ecosystems look like. And what we want, if you speak to the South African government, at any department and any level is job creation. And we want innovation around synthetic biology and crop engineering and advanced biotechnology. And I think what we're missing as a country is understanding that there's a gap both in skill and funding shortage. So you actually need to fund researchers sitting in South African universities to do this kind of chromosome scale genomics research. I, I, I don't know how many people other than me are doing this in the country, but we're not doing it at the rate and capacity at which we should to lead this research in the country and actually lead the world being South Africa. We're in this unique position. And so um, part of what I'm trying to do is get some support and, and please contact me if you're interested in how do we then as a scientific community engage with government and even the private sector to say, look, this is a major investment. We put a lot of money into things like the square kilometer array in South Africa because we said this is important. Um, arguably this transition from going from again, decades of investment in our country of describing biodiversity to benefiting from it is gonna depend on a very clear strategy around this innovation ecosystem from indigenous plant species. And maybe just to finish off by saying how, how government I think sees it, they understand universities and in, in some cases, indigenous knowledge experts as knowledge production. And they understand that the bioeconomy is something like production of novel molecules or benefiting from food crops or floriculture or conservation. This is a whole other area that I won't go into, but I'm also looking in my research into how um, we depict biodiversity and the translatability in the creative economy, but that's not for this talk. Um, but the point is there are products that come from our natural systems. And of course, government wants to see economic benefits in the form of all of these things. And I think what's being failed to acknowledge in the country, um, and this is a conversation I think we should all be having, be having is what does a successful innovation ecosystem looks like? Uh, and, and a successful innovation ecosystem has highly functioning national entities and facilities which are encouraged to then interact with primary knowledge producers um, with curiosity driven research. And that needs to translate into all kinds of products. And there are government departments that are specifically supposed to look after many of these elements. But of course, as we know, if we think of South Africa and, and what's functioning and what's not, basically every aspect of this is not functioning. And I say this in, a, in the nicest way because there are great people working in all of these institutions, but there is very little, first of all, there's not a lot of resources. And second of all, there's not a lot of incentivization to work, incentives to work both within and between institutions. And I believe this is a common problem in, in a lot of res low resource um, developing lower middle income countries which is a lot of the time the facilities exist, even the brains exist, but we don't have the ecosystem that encourages us to actually develop this as a national imperative. And so, um, yes, if anybody would like to contact me about this and help, <laughs> somehow maybe we can fix this as, as South Africans. I wanna finish off by acknowledging, this is, uh, we put this in our um, paper, and this will be published to acknowledge that the King Protea is a cultural icon 
of South Africa. It's in our um, emblem. It's an emblem of our beauty of our land and the flowering of our potential as a nation in pursuit of the African Renaissance. And it symbolizes the holistic integration of forces that grow from the earth nurtured from above. I also want to say that we acknowledge in our paper um, a dedication to say that the completion of this genome uh, we dedicate to all past, present and future researchers working on as well as people benefiting from South African biodiversity. Um, with that, I would like to thank you very much for listening to me for so long. Um, we are advertising two postdocs, and if you're happy, Laura, I can spread that for you and you can spread through your networks. Um, thank you.